a lot of times in these conservative cultures, you have the distrust of a sex toy. Is that going to threaten the male? I, mean, I don't want a relationship with my dildo. There's a lot my dildo can't do for me, but boy, <laughs> does it vibrate my clit in a nice way. Your fingers and your tongue and your penis cannot compete with a battery driven, you know, little rabbit ear. Hey, my name is Shalise Ansola, and this is Cults to Consciousness, where we discuss leaving high-demand religions or organizations and finding healing and independence through awareness and true individual sovereignty. If you would like to see our faces, head on over to our YouTube channel at Cults to Consciousness, like, subscribe, all the things, leave your comments. We are featuring comments now in our episodes, so if you have a burning question that you want answered, drop it below and you may just be featured in another episode. We are joined today today by an incredible woman. She is a sex therapist. She is licensed. She's been doing this for over 25 years. She specializes in marginalized communities such as people who are coming from high demand religions, LGBTQ communities, families, couples, she has it all, guys. She has an amazing story, and most Mormons and ex-Mormons know who she is because she was a very devout Mormon. She loved her faith, and she decided as a sex therapist, people needed more information on what is healthy when it comes to sex and masturbation specifically. The church did not like that. They called her in for a disciplinary council and excommunicated her for being vocal about what is clinically correct. So if you want to know more about her story, we go into it in depth in a previous episode that I released a few days ago. For this episode, guys, it is so juicy. There is so much great information in here. We are going deep into purity culture, how it is harmful for men, women, and people in the LGBTQ plus community. We are talking about sex, obviously. We are talking about sex media, about the common misconceptions of porn. Uh, I think some of her answers will actually surprise you when it comes to this topic. They definitely surprised me. And we're also going to be talking about how to have better orgasms and the places and resources that you can go to to learn how to have better orgasms. This is for everyone. So buckle up and let's get into it. We just have these layers upon layers upon layers of trauma and baggage to work through. What's so frustrating is that it's unnecessary trauma. They don't need to be facing all of these issues, but because of these religious bodies that are saying you are sinful, it's a sin next to murder, you have all of this noise going on in your head. You're just supposed to flip it off when you're ready to have kids and you're supposed to magically be able to orgasm. In your experience, do women even know what orgasm is by the time they get to that point when they come into your office, women or female identifying women, those who have been in high demand religions, or have you found there's zero education around sex? Yeah, well, usually there's zero education about sex. You know, there's a lot of education around reproductive sex if you've been allowed to participate in the public school system, which even a lot of families will pull their kids out of even the public school sexual education information, but there isn't very much comprehensive sexual education at all. Now, that doesn't mean that people can't orgasm, and that doesn't mean that sometimes people haven't been uh, masturbating in spite, even though they, they've been told not to. Um, but here's, here's the issue is that even like if I'm, if I'm um, talking to a vagina old owner, I'll say a clit owner this, in this particular situation. <laughs> if I'm talking to a clit or vulva owner who's been masturbating from a high demand religion, and um, so she understands her body's capacity and she knows how to orgasm, that doesn't necessarily mean that she has worked through the shame and guilt of having been a masturbator in a community where not only did she get the message that masturbation was wrong, but she got the message that boys do that. Right. Boys are the ones that masturbate. Not really girls. I mean, girls are the girls are the gatekeepers of sexuality, right? The boys are the ones who want to penetrate. The girls are just there going, oh, maybe only when we're married will you penetrate me, right? Yeah. So that's kind of the message we get because we're not we're not agents. We're not treated as sexual agents. Like we want to go get some, you know, I uh, I think it's Amanda Morell and um, and a little wow, gosh, what's Word Slut? The book Word Slut, and she's like, why why aren't we saying things like I'm gonna I'm gonna envelope you, I'm gonna <laughs> sheath you, you know? So 
like, yes. <laughs> so it's like, <laughs> so it's not, it's not just this, this person who penetrates, you know, because they've got the penis, like we're doing something too. Right. And we can, we can be quite, you know, like grabby and bring you in. We can be quite, you know, um, aggressive in our, <laughs> in our sexual <laughs> prowess if we want to be. Yeah. Uh, but that's all, no, we're all passive. We're kind of like laying back. We're treated like we're, we're back layers and we're just going to be passively waiting for this penetration. So if you're, if you're a masturbating vulva owner growing up in this culture, you're thinking, what the fuck is wrong with me? Like now, now I'm not just, I'm not just dealing with normal female shame. I'm dealing with extra shame because I'm I'm not even like my normal female counterparts. I'm extra bad because I'm sexually interested. Yeah. And um although, you know, a lot of um people with penises are sent to sex addiction treatment centers in these communities for simple things like masturbation or sexual media use that is fairly normative and all of that stuff when females are sent to these centers you can imagine the tenfold times shame that that brings about because this is supposed to be a man problem. Yeah. So these are these gender wars, right? When we really start understanding that, although we do have some hormonal differences anatomically between female bodies and male bodies, um, and male bodies typically have slightly more testosterone. We all have testosterone. We all have estrogen. Uh, there really aren't that many differences in libido. I have just as many high libido, you know, self-identifying women as I do self-identifying men in my practice and marriages um, and at different times of their life too. Sometimes it changes throughout the life cycle. Uh, you may go through a period in your life where you're the lower libido partner and then all of a sudden 10 years later, you're the higher libido partner, right? So it just depends on what's going on with your health, with baby making, with all kinds of things that happen in life. So we have a lot of misconceptions about how we show up as men and women that are really incorrect and that sometimes can become self-fulfilling prophecies because if you believe something enough, um, like, oh, women, like sex is supposed to hurt or women are supposed to like sex or as we get older with menopause, we'll just lose an interest in sex. Um, I mean, there's, there's some truth to some of those things at times, but when those things become defining to your identity, it's easy to just allow them to define your sexuality without really questioning or challenging. Uh, it's just like when you tell a kid they're stupid and lazy, that defines a lot of their educational experience when they're really not stupid or lazy. Right. And then when you have an organization or religion who is reinforcing that belief and telling you, you don't have anyone to stop you and say, oh no, sex isn't supposed to hurt. Sex is supposed to be a beautiful experience. So why would you suddenly be shaken out of this mentality that you've been raised with unless you have an outside source, a therapist, someone such as yourself who can come in and be like, oh no, honey, let me tell you all of the things that you need to know. And I'm really glad that you brought up the whole women having just as high of a libido as men, at least in your experience and what you've noticed. I think that's a huge one with purity culture is female identifying women are thinking, oh, I'm just supposed to, like you said, lay back and take it. I'm not supposed to want to do dominant things. I'm not supposed to want to tie him up. I'm not supposed to <laughs> things that can be fun and exciting. And they're just thinking, oh, I'm just supposed to be submissive. And if you want to be submissive, great. But if you don't want to be submissive, then don't be. Right. <laughs> I think there's just so many options. And this also leads into the sex media thing, which I can't wait for you to talk about this. Because a lot of people, when they don't have education in a healthy way, they turn to porn. And I'm curious to hear your opinion on what happens when people turn to porn for education and also the misconceptions about porn as far as it being good, bad, right, wrong, whatever. Yeah. No, this is, um, this is another 10 hour. <laughs> another <laughs> yeah, 10 hour four. topic, right? <laughs> 
So, I mean, I, I would say, first of all, pretty much everyone turns to porn, you know, sexual media or erotic materials, right? I think sometimes when we think of porn, we think of the current idea of visual um, videography um, that's happening kind of mainstream, maybe what you find on Pornhub or something. But I want to make sure we understand that erotic materials is all around us all the time in ways that everybody has different opinions about, mm. right? So you may go to the Smithsonian Museum of Art and see this beautiful piece of art with nude bodies. And you may say, wow, you know, what a beautiful piece of classic art. Um, and somebody else may look at that and go, what a raunchy piece of porn, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> and, and we've been as human beings interested in illustrations and creative methods of human sexuality from caveman spaces. I mean, there's beautiful caveman drawings of sperm coming out and vaginas, you know, like being open. Okay. And vulva folds <laughs> and, you know, like, <laughs> so porn, quote unquote, has been around for a long time, you know, and it's in our music and it's in our poetry. It's in our Bible. It's in our literature. It's in our movies. And, and now, you know, in modern day age, over the last, you know, probably what, 30 years or so, 50 years, Yes, it's been on video, video format. And we've all been having a bit of a porn panic about this, you know, kind of new form of um, kind of sexual expression. I don't want to get too much into the, the, the concerns of the industry because a lot of times people say, oh, but there's all this exploitation and all this worry and all this thing. And, and that's also a 10 hour discussion that we can have. Um, because there are, there can be issues, but there, as there can be with any industry. So as soon as you're wanting to talk to me about issues with sex work industry, the first and foremost thing I would say is please help legalize it. Okay. So that would be the number one thing that we can do for sex work or at least non-criminalize it. Yeah. Like it is in certain areas of the country. Because then you give sex workers power to advocate for themselves without being fearful for their own criminalization. Um, secondly, you have to worry about poverty, which none of us really want to do, quite frankly. Third of all, you have to worry about things like where does your diamond ring come from and where does your food come from? Because I would also want to talk about the exploitation of brown people in this country with immigrants who are you know, basically making our food so cheap. And people, you know, in other regions of the world making our diamonds for us in ways that are very exploitative and really, quite frankly, human rights crises. So I'm not interested in only having a sexual or an exploitation conversation when it comes to sex work. Mm -hmm. And it makes me very angry when we surround ourselves with all kinds of products. But the only time we seem to have an exploitation concern is around when people use their vaginas or penises for how they make money. And um, especially when many of those people uh, feel very empowered by the work they do, feel very consensual about the work they do, and quite frankly, make a lot better money than I do. So um, they're not asking for our protection. And, um, and there's also a very big difference between criminal sexual exploitation and consensual sex work, right. which a lot of times gets lost in this conversation. So that's a tiny little bit of what I can say of something that also is a very complex topic. Um, but what I will say about sexual media is that we're, we're all interested in it in some way or another, whether you like it or not, whether you agree with it or not, when they hook you up to all these things that they can measure all your stuff. When we look at it, we all lubricate, we all get erect, our eyeballs all go doing, our nipples all go ding. <laughs> so we all get physiologically aroused. Now, of course, physiological arousal doesn't necessarily equate to desire because you can be kind of either concerned or even disgusted by something that does physiologically arouse you. So I'm not trying to say everybody likes it, but I am saying that we all respond to it. Um, and that's pretty normal. You know, it's pretty normal to think that we are responsive to other people. We're pack animals and, mm -hmm. and something as taboo as sex. Of course, we're going to respond. That's why we respond to, to love songs and sexual songs. That's why we all have a fit when our kids hear it. And we, we all have all these anxieties around it. As far as turning to it for education, there's pros and cons to this, right? So 
Just like I say, there's pros and, co- pros and cons to turning to cooking shows for education. I mean, quite <laughs> frankly, half the cooking shows I watch, I'm like, I, my kitchen doesn't look like that. I don't want to spend three hours doing that. <laughs> I, my pots don't are not that quality. <laughs> you know, I don't want to spend the money. Yeah. My oven doesn't warm up as fast as that. I don't have two <laughs> ovens. <laughs> you know, I don't <laughs> I, I don't know how much time you took prep work to have all those nice little bowls with all the cute little diced things. You're not yeah. showing me all that. You know, you're just the dumping all these yeah. fun things that look like you made this in 20 minutes when I know it took you like four hours to do that. Um, so I'm looking at half of those cooking shows going, yeah, this is maybe fun to look at. But uh, next time at a rest- I'm at a restaurant, maybe I'll order that. Right. But every now and then. Every now and then I'm like, wow, you can put parsley in that? <laughs> hmm. I think I might put parsley uh, in that next time. You know? <laughs> I can do that. You know? So, um, so yes, I think most of us as an adults, like when we go to Fast and Furious or we go to the movies, we recognize there are lots of things in sexual media that are unrealistic, that are not real. Um, and I don't form our expectations. And what we know from the, the research is that that's actually true. Like most adults are not expecting necessarily their spouses or their sexual activities to necessarily exactly mimic what they're seeing in sexual media. Now, when I hear this coming up in high demand religions, the research doesn't support that um, people who watch porn are necessarily expecting their partners to do what's in porn. Now, I do hear that complaint from couples, and they love to blame porn for this. And I'm like, that's not porn's fault. That's sexual immaturity's fault. Maybe the fact that you don't have a lot of sexual know-how, or you come from these high-demand and um, conservative cultures where you, you're kind of like kind of like a sexual 15-year-old instead of like a 45-year-old, and you know, if you go to Fast and Furious and you're expecting your cars and you're and for you to drive like that, that's not Fast and Furious's fault. Yeah. It's kind of like <laughs> your inability to really know what the world is about and to understand um, sexuality kind of from an adult maturity level, right? So, and this is a concern we have, of course, for teens. You know, when teens are looking at sexually explicit material, we do want... Uh, parents to be talking about what we what we might term porn literacy for children and teenagers that what they see in sexual media may not be exactly what they will experience in their first sexual encounters and that they should not expect their partners necessarily to behave the way porn stars do Um, because unlike fast and furious where most of us have been driving around with our parents since we were babies most of us have not been in a bedroom watching sexual acts since we were children, right? Hopefully not anyway. So, um, so it is, it is, but it does take some level of maturity to understand that. Um, at the same time, people will watch sexual media and be kind of um, influenced by it in ways that can be very edifying and helpful. Um, so, so this is kind of like a, a yes and type of thing. Some people will say, oh, if you look at porn, you'll never be the same and you'll turn into this violent, horrible person that needs more and more and more. And you'll, you know, it'll be never ending and you'll never be satiated and um, you'll you'll become this addict and blah, 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 blah. Um, so first of all, the research does not support an addiction model for porn. So satiation does happen when people orgasm, they turn the porn off. That doesn't happen when people gamble. Yes. You go to Las Vegas and you see somebody win, they keep on pushing the lever. Doesn't matter that they won. So there's a satiation aspect to using sexual media. Most people use sexual media to masturbate or to have sex until they orgasm. And once they orgasm and they're completed and they stop, they, they move on with their, their day. And most people who feel compulsive or impulsive around porn use, it's really an anxiety response to all of this drama that we've created about not using porn. Just like every time I go on a diet, 
I eat differently than what I'm normally eating. Because whenever you increase anxiety about a certain human behavior, guess what we unfortunately do with that behavior? Sadly, we usually increase it. Mm -hmm. This is what's so tragic about these religious communities is that people who really want to decrease this behavior, we're putting so much emphasis on decreasing it and not doing it that we're increasing all this anxiety, which we know in the human system just increases the, the, the potential for that behavior to increase. And that doesn't matter what the behavior is, whether it's spending money, eating, sexuality, uh, spanking your children. Um, if you can't take an acceptance approach, if you can't take a more like mindfulness, judgmental less approach to your behavior, it will actually increase versus decrease. So all of this anxiety and telling everybody to stop because it's going to get, you know, they're going to go to hell actually makes that behavior more likely to increase than decrease. Right. I read somewhere that Utah has the highest number of porn subscriptions than any other state. Yeah. And that's not surprising. And I think they find that to be true in most of the kind of red, kind of Christian-esque right. um, states. Um Although there's another argument to be said, well, is it because they're honestly subscribing to porn versus just downloading it for free? Who knows? <laughs> oh Who my knows? gosh, that's <laughs> such a good point. You always have to take these statistics with a grain of salt. <laughs> wow, that is hilarious. Oh my gosh. But on the other side of that argument, I want to say, you know, yes, we are influenced by other people. We can learn from other people. And this is where actually sexual media can enhance sexuality. It can, you know, you learn from other people. You, you're like, oh, wow, I, I, I can maybe move like that or sigh like that or, you know, act like this person. Or I can be attracted to this kind of thing. You know, one thing that I've noticed a lot since doing my sexual training, because we're we're exposed to a lot of different sexual medias. We're exposed to, you know, just sexual training. Um, my ability to find people of size attractive and people of age attractive has exponentially grown in my erotic template. And that's because I wasn't exposed. I wasn't exposed to people of size yeah. and people of age. Um, and I'm a person of size, right? But I was always so judgmental of myself. Because I didn't look a certain way because all we're exposed to are, you know, small, young bodies in kind of like typical movies mm -hmm. um, that are sexual. But as I've seen so many more bodies act in sexual ways, now I'm like, oh, that's, that's yummy. You know, that's I like, I'm, I'm noticing my own arousal, my lubrication. And, um, and I really, and, and so my, my sexual template, my erotic template has become more diverse as I've exposed myself to sexual media. So yes, it does change you, as does everything in life. I mean, are you just going to sit in your bedroom because you're like, oh my gosh, if I go out there, I'm, my brain is going to change. Yeah. Oh my gosh, if I, <laughs> if I do this new activity, my brain is going to change. Oh my gosh. I mean, we just, of course, of course we're changing. Of course, everything is going to affect you and change you and evolve you. But that isn't that doesn't mean you're headed towards an addiction or towards, um, you know, the scary thing. We're, we're, again, it's a fear-based approach to just normal human behavior. And the more scared of it you are, the more power it has to negatively affect you. Whereas the more open and curious and I can take it or leave it approach you have, eh, not so powerful. Yeah. Not so powerful. I'm curious from your perspective, then, what is considered a normal amount of viewing sexual media or porn? I'm sure everyone's wondering, like, what is normal? <laughs> yeah, so that, yeah, so this normal, we're, we're really trying to stop the normal. You know, in the field of sexology, um, we're really trying to get away from the word normal because mm. the variety and diversity of human sexuality is so broad. Uh, we can talk about normative, you know, if, you, if any of you have taken statistics, there's always like that bell curve, you know, which means where do most people maybe fall, but even the people on the fringes or on the outliers, that doesn't mean that you're abnormal. It, it doesn't mean that you're sick or diseased or weird. Um, 
this is the whole argument of the asexual community. You know, they were like, why are you all trying to treat us like we have to be sexual? Um, yeah, maybe they're a smaller segment of the society, but that doesn't mean that they have to fit into this box with the rest of us, that they have to like sex and have to want sex and have to be in a sexual relationship in order to be deemed normal and healthy and have a fulfilled life, right? So I think people can really not ever be interested in sexual media from the perspective of like um, classic porn, mainstream porn, maybe never really want to watch that. And I'd be like, fine, I don't care. (laughs) It's not like you're unhealthy because you don't want to watch it. Yeah. Or you don't find it tasteful or it goes against your values and you just don't like it. Um, And then there's people that watch it daily and masturbate to it daily. And I'm like, that's fine. And who cares? Like, are you living your life? Are you, are you meeting your goals? Are you well balanced in your life? Those are the questions I'm much more interested in. Now, if you are watching porn and masturbating for, let's say, six hours a day, and you're distressed about it, and you're feeling like it's interfering with your relationships and your ability to work and your ability to, I don't know, have hobbies, um, maybe there's some level of obsessiveness or compulsivity that has but that's that again that's not porn's fault. Porn didn't create that. Yes, exactly. That's most people aren't having that relationship with porn. But there is there that people do have mental health disorders that do affect different parts of their life and that show up in different ways and we need to treat that. We need to help you figure out how to treat whatever it is that we need to assess correctly so that you can have your best life and incorporate sex and sexual media and relationships and other things in your life in in the best ways that you want for you to feel like, hey, my life is, I'm content, you know, I'm, I'm good. Such good information. Oh my goodness. We could talk for 10 hours. Maybe we go into part five. Um (laughs) (laughs) So real quick, I have some questions from my Instagram listeners. They wrote in some questions that they wanted to ask you specifically. Question number one from Amanda Ruth underscore artistry. How to raise kids without sexual shame? And she's coming from a perspective of not raising her kids in a religious institute. Yeah, I think the best way to raise kids is to normalize a lot of things about sexuality, start from a very early age, have an ongoing conversation. This is not a one-time sex talk type of you know, household and, and really teach them principles of sexual health. Right. And, and we start with something as simple as consent and consent can be from teaching toddlers about how to not, how to stop tickling each other or wrestling with each other. When one person says, Hey, stop, you know, or Mm. like you, you start with very simple things that really don't even necessarily have to do with sex, sex, but it does have to do with how you use your body and how you have boundaries and whether or not you want to hug somebody or whether or not you want to hug grandma. Um, and, and so you can teach your kids and the people around them kind of some of these principles that then help with concepts of pleasure, concepts of consent, concepts of honesty, um, and how they're going to show up in their sexual lives later. And those are really the principles that are missing in comprehensive sexual education where we're talking about uteruses and fallopian tubes and sperm and, um, It's like, okay, that's great. That's the function. But what about the relational components and how do we interact with people and how do we know when we're ready or not ready and and what to do in those spaces of kind of questioning? Because, you know, although we, we would love for all experiences to be like, yes, I'm ready for this. The reality is that a lot of times when you're trying something new, you're hesitant. You're you're kind of like, well, I think I'm ready. I don't know if I'm ready. I might be ready. I'm ready right now. Now I'm not feeling ready two seconds later. You know, so kids need to understand that that's a very normal part. And, and how do they manage those types of situations when they're 14, 17, um, even 21 emerging adults? Uh, because I don't think sexual education ends when they're 18. And uh, can we continue to have those conversations with our emerging adult children? Yes, absolutely. I love that you brought in just being in control of your body in general when it's not even relating to sexual experience because 
of course, it makes it makes so much sense teaching your children that they can have boundaries and that's okay, knowing when not to cross boundaries of other people. And just consent in general is so important and something that is totally lost on a lot of these people who grew up in purity culture only or abstinence only. You know, teach them how to finally approach someone when they do want to have a sexual experience. So 100% on board with that. Next question from team underscore rocket out. Speak on repressed sexuality and the various ways it can manifest after, after leaving a high control group. Yeah, and I think we've kind of been addressing that, you know, along the way. But I think some of the ways that it can really show up for people is this kind of discomfort in your own skin, discomfort with knowing your own pleasure, sometimes even if you know how to pleasure yourself, uh, translating that into a relational type of context, um, knowing how to orgasm with somebody, knowing how to surrender to somebody else's um, and in somebody else's space. A lot of times I think uh, whether it's from a lot of the messages that we've been received, we've been talking about through religion or through media, we have kind of a performance type of approach to sexuality. Like I'm supposed to look a certain way or act a certain way or be a certain way instead of just being surrendering into pleasure and into, into the moment and into the now and into what my skin is feeling and what my emotions are feeling and what our eye gaze is doing and what we want to hear and say to each other. So it can be very difficult coming from these repressed spaces to know how to even to do something as simple as um, be flirtatious in a sensual way. Again, like if you're, if you're born into um, a female body, if you're, you've been told not to be too sexual, right? But Mm -hmm. so how do you now become sensual and sultry and flirtatious and how to use your eyes and your, and how do you moan and how do you move your body in, in sensual ways without Oh, am I acting like a porn star? You know, yes. am I, am I, is he expecting me to be a porn star? And, and I'm like, but what the hell are porn stars doing that is, that's so amazing? I mean, they're just moving and sighing and, and doing what we all can do, right? I mean, it's not that dramatic of a thing. <laughs> so, um, so I think sometimes we don't feel comfortable in just the, the basic acts of, of just kind of human sexuality, which is the verbal, the throat, where's your throat at? Where's your movement? Where's your hip action? And a lot of times when I'm talking to couples, it just seems like it's very quiet. It's very dark. It's very, you know, we're not really sharing a whole lot. Um, Or maybe it feels like you're contained to like a soft type of sex. Like we have to love make, which is beautiful. There's nothing wrong with vanilla, soft making, love making, um, sex. In fact, you know, if you haven't tried, tried Tantra, like by all means, like go into that type of space. That's wonderful. Sometimes we don't know how to hold eye gaze really. Have you ever tried to keep your eyes open and really look at each other while you're having an an orgasm? I mean, that's pretty amazing. Right? Right. At the same time, (laughs) there's this whole like kind of naughty or dirty or taboo part of sexuality and being raunchy. And sometimes when I swear on on shows like this, it's not because I'm trying to be crass. It's because I'm trying to get us to be comfortable with language that's been so tabooed and so like divorced from our proper polite selves. And sex isn't proper and polite. Sex is is animalistic. Sex is um, a surrender. It's fluid. I mean, literally like fluids are coming out of you, right. In ways that you can't control. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's very hard when you've been told in these cultures to be proper and perfectionistic and very quaffed and quiet and reverent, polite and kind. How does that all translate to sexuality? Uh, we, and, and then on top of it, when, when you have seen people who are in sensual or sexual, they've been shamed. That's the, that's the horror. That's the slut. Don't be like them. Right. Or the man who, who's like too bachelor type and too studly. And he's, you know, he's dangerous. He's, he's, he's bad news. You know, he's, he's scary because he's out to get you for your sex. Yeah. Oof, yeah. A lot of that's probably going to come out. I mean, that's why I feel like I don't know that any of us don't have sexual healing to do sexual healing work. Um, Cause I think these, these messages permeate whether you grew up in a very orthodox home or a progressive home, or even a non-religious home, these messages are, 
are kind of in our Judeo-Christian culture and they permeate our legal system, they permeate our media stories, they permeate our, our entertainment. They're there. I, I can see them all over the place. Yeah, absolutely. I'm really glad that you called that out. I think for me and my experience, repressed sexuality leads to mind-body-soul disconnect, where you are completely disconnected from your intuition, from noticing parts of your body, like, oh, I'm feeling something, whereas before you completely shut it off because if you feel something, that means that you're a sinner and that means you should be ashamed of it. So reconnecting with myself has been a big thing. Just even you know, feeling your arms. What does this feel like if I just touch my legs? Feeling those sensations and getting to know yourself. Also allowing yourself to let go, as you mentioned. What does it sound like if I moan like this? Do I like it? Do I not? I don't know, but we'll explore and have fun with it and finding a partner who can help assist you in that yes. safe exploration or by yourself. <laughs> you know, yes. Maybe you don't need a partner and that's okay yes. too. So the last one is from someone who would like to remain anonymous, and the question is, can extreme religious upbringing cause a woman to not be able to orgasm? Uh, yeah, so um, the research has shown that uh, sexual shame or conservative religions do have somewhat of a correlation definitely with vaginismus and genital pain disorders um, for vagina and vulva owners. And of course, that can lead also to anorgasmia, right? So um, again, like like you just mentioned very clearly, if we're kind of taught to repress our sexuality, turn it off, you know, the, the Book of Mormon <laughs> musical is like, turn like it off. Like a light switch. <laughs> <laughs> so if, you're, if you've trained yourself to kind of turn it off and and present very pure and virginous and virtuous and all these kind of ways. And, and that's very much oftentimes part of your identity. Now it's internalized identity, right? Is to be this kind of virtuous, lovely, kind, quiet, smiley you know, <laughs> a person. That's very different than the, the different body posture of an orgasm. Right. And and again, it can feel very embarrassing. It can feel like, am I to really let go of yourself in that way? You really have to kind of like you're saying, disconnect um, in a different way. Like, like from all that anxiety, you have to disconnect from your anxiety in order to really have orgasm. And, and that can be very difficult if you're holding yourself in kind of an anxious posture, you know, pretty much all the time. And so and knowing even how to take up space because, uh, and again, this isn't just a religious thing. Um, it's a patriarchal thing where vulva owners have gotten tons of role modeling from tons of different spaces on how to centrifuge male sexuality, right? So if, if the man is happy, if the man has orgasmed, if the man has been pleased, then we've been successful. Mm -hmm. That's the, that's the culmination of sexual success. Now, granted, we've made a lot of progress in that over the last 50 years. And there's actually now a lot of men who are like, honey, like, let me help you out. You know, like, I want to, I want to help you get there which then sadly creates its own different type of pressure, right? Because he's like, please let me help you. And she's like, ah. you know, like <laughs> that's a lot of pressure you know, yes. to have this person like try to be helpful. So it's like kind of like this sad, like uh, irony of, 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 of events, right? Because you've got a really well-meaning partner who wants the partner to feel pleasure, but the, that, that, that focus on her can sometimes be a lot of pressure. Um, so, and, and I don't think that we've role modeled females knowing how to take up space, how to take up sexual space. Like, yes, yes, you can take the 20 to 45 minutes it's going to take to go down on me or to stimulate my nipples or to stroke my neck or to, um, you know, stroke my hair or my, you know, my earlobes or all the different erogenous zones, right? Sometimes too, we're way too uh, genital focused, mm. right? Like we think, okay, we're going to have sex. 
it's it's penis and vagina sex, right? Or we're we're too intercourse focused, right? So we've got it still shocks me how many vagina owners don't know that only about 25% of us effectively reach orgasm through penis and vagina intercourse alone. Wow, 25%. Most people think that that's the normal way to have sex. I'm like that's not the normal way to have sex. That's that's intercourse. It's a normal way to I guess reproduce a baby. But it's not the normal way to really have female orgasm. Right. So um and then you know added to that a lot of times in these conservative cultures you have the distrust of a sex toy which can be very effective in helping a female orgasm. Sure but can. <laughs> if, you know, but then that's like, is that an unholy practice? Is that an, a thing that something that's going to interfere between us? Is that, is that going to threaten the male partner? Because now you're going to depend on this thing instead of me. Um, because there's a lot of these messages that happen with religious couples where it's only supposed to be you and I that create this, this thing between us. And and that's why we um, struggle with masturbation. We struggle with sex toys. We struggle with sexual media. We struggle with anything that, and I'm like, instead of seeing those things as threats, can you see them as tools or tools in your toolbox to help the two of you enhance your sexuality? They're not there to replace you. I mean, I don't want a relationship with my dildo. I mean, I like my dildo, but right? not that much. <laughs> it's, not, it's not like I'm, I'm loving on my dildo. You know, I <laughs> I still want you. Right. I still want to love you and yeah. have a conversation with you. There's a lot my dildo can't do for me, but boy, <laughs> does it vibrate my clit in a nice way that, you know, yeah, sorry, yeah. your fingers and your tongue and your penis cannot compete with a battery driven, you know, little rabbit ear. But who cares? Who cares? Because if you're there with me while you're helping me in that way, guess where all my emotional bonding goes? It does not go to my rabbit ear dildo. Exactly. Now the rabbit ear dildo helps me, but I, while I'm looking at you, holy crap, you know, that really ends up creating all this amazing bonding between us Mm -hmm. and helps me reach orgasm. And the one place that I would totally, um, if people don't know about it, I'm, I'm constantly advertising for them is omgs.com. So that's a site that has revolutionized, I think, information for vagina owners who are wondering how to orgasm very very tastefully done research done done by by scientists yes it does have some sexually explicit videos because they're showing you they're showing you see this is education Perfect. you want to learn how to cook you got to go get a lesson you want to <laughs> learn how to play the violin you got to go get a lesson Sometimes when we want to learn how to orgasm, you got to go get a lesson. Right. So this is very tastefully done. It's female driven by, you know, female and it's not actors. It's, it's people who are really teaching you and doing it very well. Not all the videos are sexually explicit. There's even if you don't want to look, I've had some people go on there and they don't, they choose not to look at the sexually explicit videos, but they look at a lot of the people talking and just talking and describing the methods of how to reach orgasm. Um, has been very helpful and has helped them. It used to be that a woman's body was a mystery. We couldn't figure it out. And these researchers were like, how mysterious can it really be? I mean, we all got the same parts, right? So (laughs) they came up with like eight to 12, very effective, like rhythm and pressure and, you know, circular ways that you can use your fingers or your tongue or a toy or even your penis, uh, your partner's penis uh, to, um, effectively reach orgasm because although we talk about clitoral stimulation and clitoral stimulation is important in any orgasm, it doesn't necessarily mean that you always want direct clitoral stimulation. And it doesn't mean that every person likes stimulation in the same way. Amazing. I'm so glad you brought up that website. I was going to ask if there were any resources and then you just filled in the blanks. Are there any other places people can go, even if it's doing sessions with you? I know you have your focus groups and support groups. Tell everybody what you're up to and other resources that they can use to help their sex life. Sure. So I, yeah, I'm, as you can tell, I'm very passionate about trying to help with lots of things, mainly issues with faith transition and mainly issues with sexuality, right? I feel like those two things are very intertwined. 
So if you go to natashahelfer.com, you'll find everything that I'm offering. Currently, I have a membership that you can join for free and also a premium membership. So we're going to be doing like for free a once a month kind of support system for you. And then if you want the premium, we'll be meeting weekly just to kind of have a lot of support around a lot of these topics that you may be struggling with as well as other resources. Um, I have lots of webinars. I have like a sex, um, like how to talk to your kids about sex, 10 part webinar. So lots of resources in that way. Uh, we are currently running a lot of groups. Some of them are free, especially for faith transitions, but I also run groups for, uh, how to deal with religious trauma. Cause that's a little bit different than just a run of the mill faith transition. Some people, you know, after a few weeks or months are doing fine. Other people are really kind of having more of a PTSD response to leaving their religion. So I do a group on that. I do a group on reclaiming female sexuality. I do a group on male sexual shame, especially for those of you who have been um, maybe sent to these sexual addiction treatment centers that were ineffective for you and that really kind of probably added to the shame that you're feeling. Um, I do a, a post kind of religious marriage group because I, you know, even if you leave together, it doesn't mean you're going to stay together. I think there's a lot of relational skills we were never taught. I do a post um, religion marriage sexuality group for couples. Um, I'm going to start the pornography dilemma group this coming year, which is I've been avoiding it for years because I know it's going to be tense, but I want to help couples know how to deal with that pornography wound and dilemma in sex positive, helpful ways that where both of them feel validated and advocated for. Um, we're also going to be doing a mixed orientation group for couples that are really struggling with um, having either two queer people or one queer person and one straight person in that relationship. So we have lots of resources. All of that can be found in NatashaHelfer.com. I also do a female sexual trauma group. Many of these groups are starting now in January for, and I offer most of these groups two times, sometimes three times a year. So come join me. Wow. You have a group for everything. You've thought of everything, Natasha. It's amazing. I am trying to. I am trying to. <laughs> I, I just, I know, I know the pain points. I've been doing this for 25 years almost now. And it just, it just hurts my heart. And I just want to have resources for all these things that people have been asking me for resources for decades, I'm trying to create them. There's certainly a need for what you're doing. So thank you. Yeah, those of you who are therapists who are listening, I have a whole training on how to work with sexuality and religious people as of well. Of course she does. She's got everything, guys. <laughs> <laughs> and your Instagram handle for all the people who want to follow you. It's at Natasha Helfer, MFT. So like marriage and family therapist. So yeah. And before we go, we need our Linda Listen moment. So anything you want to say to an organization who's pissed you off or any type of inspiration or advice for those who are listening? Okay, so I think that with my thoughts of being comfortable with naughty language, because I think we need to go there, I want to give my faith community leaders uh, a loving Fuck you, patriarchal pricks, for trying to harm me because that's that's just very naughty. Yes. And not very ministering of you. And what I want to say to the people who are listening is the best way to deal with sexual shame comes from a song that you might have heard on sexual education, the show that maybe some oh, of you have watched, show. which is Fuck the Shame Away. And there's real, like, actual evidence to help you understand that if you do something over time, the shame will dissipate. So those are my snarky moments for the day. Oh, those are amazing. Linda listens like a, 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 a loving fuck you and a loving fuck the shame away. <laughs> <laughs> that might be my favorite Linda listen to date. Both of those. Those were amazing. Thank you so much for sharing your time. I would love to bring you back for all of our parts because we have lots to talk about. <laughs> um, is there anything you would like to add? Any final thoughts before we sign off? No, I think this has been great. I, I'm always willing to come and talk about sex and I'll love to have you on my podcast as well. So Amazing. <laughs> we'll, see you, we'll see you soon. I am looking forward to that.
And for everyone listening, thank you so much for your support. I have two new patrons this month. Thank you so much to Dina Cardi and Ruthie. I appreciate you. Every little bit helps me to do this work. So thank you so much. And until next time, follow your highest excitement, be conscious and be well. Thanks for listening. If you like what you hear, it would mean a lot if you could like and subscribe on YouTube and leave a review or a comment to help with our visibility. You can also find me on social media at Colts to Consciousness or reach out by email at Colts to Consciousness at gmail.com.